I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, the good and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. Welcome to The Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm your co-host, Dean Detloff. And I'm your other co-host, Matt Bernico. And this week on the show, we have a Magnificast favorite back, Marika Rose. Everybody loves her. You hear her every episode. <laughs> She's the last quote before you hear us say something dumb uh, in the intro. She's great. Uh, a few episodes. Maybe, what has she been on? Three other times before? One of the rare... I think so. A rare four-time uh, guest here on the show, and this one I expect is going to be a popular one as well. Um, she always has a unique angle on something, and I always go away thinking a lot harder about my life in ways that I appreciate and I'm also frustrated by, so this is definitely <laughs> one of those situations. Uh, she's here to talk about a book called Theology for the End of the World, a new one out from SCM Press, and you should get it. It's very good. Yeah, I... <laughs> I want to say that this is a book of theology that is very thoughtful and provoking, but it's also one that you can definitely read. This is not like a, <laughs> you know, sometimes we have people on the show and it's like extremely academic and it's going to be like a 500 page history of the Sandinistas or something, which is great. I mean, for sure, but not for everybody, but this book it's for everybody. So, <laughs> so, so go ahead and get it is what I'm saying. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Marika is a great writer in addition to being a great thinker. And man, I can't remember, maybe I've never done this. I can't remember the last time I would have laughed reading a theology book, but there are some good jokes. Uh, there's some great object lessons in there. So I think it's a, it's a winner. Um, before we get to the conversation, though, uh, two interesting announcements. Um, one is that, if you can't tell by our voices, Matt and I are sick. <laughs> so you'll probably hear that in the rest of this interview as well. Uh, maybe a few uh, coughs and sniffles, I don't know. Uh, but you can look out for that. Um, I'm sure we'll be better very soon. More importantly, though, uh, on our Patreon, we decided Matt and I have committed this year to reading the whole Bible in a year. That's right, Genesis to Revelation, including some of the bonus books you find in the orthodox canon uh, and the catholic canon as well and our discord folks are reading along together and if you want to read the whole bible in a year with some christian lefty folks you can do it by signing up at our patreon at patreon.com slash the magnificast when this comes out we'll have been a week into it so the beginning of genesis has already passed us by but it won't take you long to catch up uh matt what's your what's your big Genesis hot take so far after reading it every day? My biggest Genesis hot take is that Kane is Bigfoot. <laughs> That's right, folks. That's my hot take. Um, <laughs> we read that bit the other day, and it reminded me of this weird thing I remember from, I think, Reddit or somewhere. I, if you listen back to all of the uh, Behind the Paywall podcasts that we do, you might come across it, but there's a very interesting Mormon belief that uh, suggests that Cain is Bigfoot. And uh, that's the only thing I could think of the entire time I was reading that part of Genesis. <laughs> that's what have right. you that's thought about, the, Dean? That's the level of commentary you're going to get in this Discord. Um, I did. I am having all kinds of flashbacks to being an evangelical, which is really funny, remembering Bible studies in ways that are <laughs> healthy and unhealthy for me, I think. But uh, I did uh, also think a lot about Cain specifically. And the thing that stuck out to me um, I used to be a Christian anarchist, a big Bible reading evangelical Christian anarchist, and one of the most compelling arguments for it 
is that Cain is the first murderer, and he's also remembered as, like, the founder of cities, or the first recorded builder of a city. So there's this kind of, like, anti-civilization, anti-urbanist trend that you get throughout the Bible, but it really starts right away in uh, the beginning of Genesis. So, yeah, we're, uh, people are pulling in all kinds of really fun stuff. Everybody's comparing their translations. They're pulling in weird associations with other lefty stuff. Uh, it's great. It's the best Bible study I've ever been part of, and you too can do it at patreon.com slash the Magnificast. I can't believe that Bigfoot built the first city. All right. <laughs> but now we're going to go talk to Marika Rose about something smart. Marika, welcome back to the show. We had you on not too long ago to talk about angels. <laughs> that was very fun. People should go back and listen to that episode for sure. But this time we've got you back to talk, talk about your newest book, Theology for the End of the World. This book is very cool for a lot of different reasons. I bought it immediately <laughs> once I saw that it came out. Um, I'm psyched about this book. It's got a lot of really novel ideas about theology and philosophy, um, as well as being written in a really, I think, fun and entertaining way. I was very entertained reading the book, which is not something that you get out of theology a lot. Um, <laughs> but before before we get too far ahead of ourselves and me like gushing about how much I like this book, uh, could you tell us about it and, um, I don't know, maybe give a, a summation of the work? Yeah, so it's, it's a kind of loosely connected series of essays, basically, uh, thinking about um, how did Christianity get us into this mess and what do we do about it now? And the kind of overall pitch of the book is... Um, everyone's very worried about saving the world, but what if we should actually stop trying to save the world and try instead to end it? Um, what if the goal is not to kind of hold on to the systems and social structures that, that give us some degree of security, but actually to recognise the ways that um, pretty much everything about the world as, as we have organised it um, is built on violence, um, violence that's really kind of caught up with the history of Christianity. Um, and what would it what would it look like to take a kind of abolitionist approach to the world understood in that way? Um, so there's, there's chapters on various different bits, kind of tracing some of the history of how Christianity has produced the world um, that we live in today, um, talking about sex and marriage and money and freedom and power and slavery. Um, and sort of trying to think through how do we how do we understand what the world is and um, how do we understand uh, uh, the way that the history of Christianity has kind of brought us to the point that we're at um, and then what can we do um, in the face of all the different kinds of violence that surround us. Yeah, it's a great book, I think, for that reason. There are so many themes, so many different angles or ways into it, and really emphasizing that Christian component or kind of Christian contribution to constructing all this uh, all this bad news, as you put it, uh, I think is really helpful. Um, and I think it's also great maybe for listeners who are like orbiting some academic conversations around these issues, but maybe are intimidated by reading, you know, a thousand big scholarly works. I feel like you do a great job not just summarizing some of that stuff, but really like making it usable and and uh, offering your own contribution. That's great. Um, you've been also getting a lot of feedback uh, about the book, and some of it has been really interesting to read and kind of watch you process. So do you want to maybe say something about that? How, how have people been reading it? Have you had any kind of surprising reactions to it? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the my favorite so far was the, the Church Times review, which uh, described the book as too angry and gratuitously crude um, and counted. Uh, Listeners should beware there are five swear words, which I know because this review <laughs> accounted every time um, I swore. Um, and I've had a, yeah, I, and I mean, I thought that was interesting in itself. Um, actually, a couple of reviewers have commented on that, because I think one of the themes of the book is uh, the way that Christian ideas about purity come into being and actually are uh, really deeply part of a lot of the things that are fucked up about Christianity. Um, so it's kind of interesting that people have sort of reacted against the the swearing and not thought about the kind of broader kind of argument and how, how it actually might be quite consistent with what I'm saying. Um, one uh, one thing again that a couple of different reviewers have said is, um, oh, this book doesn't give you any answers, um, which I have found interesting because, again, I think one of the things I've really tried to do in the book is talk about the way that um, Christian narratives of redemption, again, are, are really kind of part of the problem a lot of the time that we want everything to fit together we want everything to make sense um, and we want Christianity to be good and actually that really makes it difficult for us to confront the ways that actually a lot of the time what we value about Christianity is really caught up with the stuff that is fucked up that that, that actually the the violence 
um, and the care that people find in church, I think a lot of the time are really um, two sides of the same coin. We actually can't separate them out. Um, and I think partly what I am trying to do in the book is say, rather than trying to kind of come up with a solution that makes us feel good, that gives us a version of Christianity that we feel good about, actually partly what we should be doing is trying to grapple with that complexity and to face up to the, the ways that the good and the bad are actually really closely related to each other. Um, and I think also as part of that, um, this 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 tendency that Christianity often gives us to want to think about the whole world, uh, the whole kind of whole history of salvation and how we can kind of neatly wrap that up. Um, and, we're, and again, in a way that I think causes lots of problems, we want to feel like we're winning. Uh, we want to feel like we know where things are going. And I think actually that can be a real distraction from thinking about the particular places and, and circumstances that we're in. So not how do we how do we solve all the problems? And kind of what I'm trying to do in the book is is give people some tools for thinking about well, what's going on in your particular context, in your particular workplace or community. Um, how do you face up to uh, the kind of particulars around you without necessarily feeling like there's kind of one solution that's 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 going to fix everything? Um, so yeah, I mean, I I would say that. Uh, in some ways, what I'm trying to do, this is a very Zizeki thing, is, is get people to ask good questions about what they do in, in the places that they are, um, rather than kind of telling people, because it, it will look different in different places. What it what it looks to try and work for the abolition of the world in a university is going to be different than what it looks like in a church or in a school or in a shop. Um, so depending where people are, I think there are different kind of questions and problems. And I'm kind of trying to give people the resources to think about those particular situations rather than being like, hey, here's my um, five step program for solving everything. Um, in part because I think, you know, if you look at if you look at things as they currently are, I think it's very clear that we haven't figured out what the answers are. Um, and I think maybe there's some space for experimentation and exploration. And that actually might be more productive than trying to kind of figure out in advance uh, what the answer is. Relatedly, I, I'm kind of interested in, in what you guys think is that a few people have have suggested that the book's actually very evangelical, which I've been slightly surprised by. Um, I think a lot of my church experience is evangelical, but a lot of my theological uh, dialogue partners are not. Um, and yeah, I, I was kind of interested in, in what you guys might think about that, because um, I think maybe some of the specific examples are evangelical, but I don't know that the, the argument of the book as a whole is. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. Well, it's it's interesting to hear all of those responses because I had the exact opposite reaction. First of all, I thought there weren't enough swear words I could have done with far <laughs> yeah. more than five. Um, and also, I think there's a, there's a lot of advice. Maybe not advice. There's a lot of usability. There's some there's some tools for grappling with these big ideas in here. Um, it, interesting that someone would say it's evangelical because I don't get that distinction at all. Um, maybe that there's you know like a lot of the bad stuff <laughs> that you talk about in your book is tied up in American evangelicalism, but I don't get the sense that the book itself is trying to be preachy to anybody about something. Uh, maybe uh, one thing that is particularly useful about it is, as you say, you draw a lot of um, references or maybe kind of examples from evangelicalism. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, there is sort of a moment of whatever you want to call it, deconstruction, post-evangelicalism, all these kind of terms that are floating around for better and for worse. And I think that your book is really well positioned to enter that space, maybe in a more readily available way than, than other resources, and also maybe in an easier way than, for example, like a Catholic space. Like I spend all my time organizing Catholics, and I imagine it would be harder for them to connect. Not impossible. I'm, I'm sure there are lots of Catholics. I mean, I'm Catholic, and I think it's great. <laughs> but, you know, like, uh, there's a great moment where you, you talk about C.S. Lewis, for example, and I think the line you say is, you wouldn't be a Christian if it weren't for C.S. Lewis, and then go on to kind of, you know, parse that out and kind of trouble that a little bit in some really interesting ways. So maybe it connects with evangelicals, but in a, in a really positive way. Like, I almost feel like that's a... I wouldn't call the book an evangelical book, but certainly something for people wrestling with that particular expression in a, in a unique way, perhaps. I don't know. What what, what do you think, Marika, kind of processing that, that feedback as well? Is, is it an evangelical book? Is it a, a dis-evangelical book? What's going on there? I mean, I think in some ways, you know, if we're talking about um, contemporary Western secular societies, in lots of ways what we're talking about is societies that are probably more the product of Protestantism than they are of Catholicism. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, you know, some, some of my best friends are Catholics, um, and I, I think that a lot of the a lot of the kind of classical theology that I really keep coming back to is from a kind of broader spectrum. Um, 
I talk about Aquinas, um, I talk about Augustine, um, I know evangelicals sometimes like Augustine, but certainly the evangelicals I grew up never around never read Augustine. Um, and I think in some ways, yeah, but I, I mean, partly what I hope comes out in the book is a sense of uh, Christianity as this kind of series of deep disagreements about things. So um, uh, I'm kind of as interested in the disagreements as I am in the kind of key trends that seem to, to recur or seem to be particularly important in terms of understanding kind of where we are right now. Um, yeah, I think it, it does do a good job of showing that, but also it tells you kind of like what to do with those disagreements or, you know, strategies for processing some of those things. I know that like, I don't know, if if I had a person in my life who was going through <laughs> figuring out evangelicalism, I would definitely recommend this book to yeah. them because uh, it does kind of give you some handles for that conversation and like what, what to do with it. Um, but maybe we can turn to the book for a minute and talk about some of the the content. Uh, you open up the book with some some current or, I guess, at this point, recent events, but climate catastrophes, police violence, rising fascism, and on and on. <laughs> Lots of current events at the top of this book. Um, and it's not unusual to hear someone say, maybe hyperbolically, maybe seriously, that the current situation that we're in as a as a as a people, as a as a planet, <laughs> is apocalyptic. Uh, but you go on to explain some really important nuance about the word apocalypse, uh, meaning not so much the end of days, well, sometimes, but also like a type of revelationary and revolutionary moment uh, where something else is going on, a revealing. So can you talk about that distinction a bit in in what you think makes our current moment apocalyptic? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, what I think I'm saying is that it it's not as apocalyptic as I would, would like it to be, that, that often you get this idea of apocalypse as an unveiling, that the kind of the, the the deep truth of a situation is revealed. And as that deep truth of the situation is revealed, there's some kind of transformation. And I think what feels what feels kind of terrifying about things as they are is it feels like more and more the the absolute violence that constitutes a lot of kind of global systems and structures is becoming more and more obvious than ever. And yet it feels like even these kind of revelations don't change anything um you know i think if we if we think about what's what's going on in palestine at the moment what, what what's felt really horrifying to me is just seeing this like absolute attempt to destroy a group of people and it's very obvious that that's happening people are very openly stating pretty genocidal intentions um we are seeing what's happening kind of day by day and yet it, it doesn't feel like it's enough to change anything you know people are out on the streets and still uh governments don't seem to show any signs of kind of doing anything differently and I think what what feels to me particularly grim about our current situation is that it feels like all this stuff is kind of coming to light all of this stuff is becoming visible and yet actually that doesn't seem to change anything it's like something gets stuck in that process this revelation happens but then nothing changes um and I think part of that is because um it almost feels like we're in a situation where um for anything to change uh maybe because so much has been revealed for anything at all to change it feels like the whole the whole thing would have to fall apart um i think a little bit about um both both the bernie sanders and the corbyn campaigns in the uk and the us that you have people putting forward really kind of pretty moderate uh maybe slightly socialist programs where they're not you know they're not kind of demanding a the end of capitalism it's little things like maybe maybe tenants should have a legal right to own pets and people are reacting like it's this kind of absolute existential threat like if we if we allow this small concession everything will change and it feels like just this real doubling down on we can't let anything change because if anything changes it all falls apart um uh which you know good <laughs> let it all fall apart um uh but yeah, I think it's it's that feeling of of things being so clear, of many things having been revealed, and then just getting kind of stuck at, at the stage where it feels like that should lead to a transformation. It should lead to something changing, um, and yeah, maybe something about the current the current state of capitalism being being such that if we do allow small changes, that that kind of leads into bigger changes that just are not not kind of possible if we're going to keep keep this thing going. Yeah, as you're talking to, I'm thinking already about that kind of temptation in Christianity that you deal with to try to save the world all the time, right? I feel like uh, anytime someone's like, well, everybody knows that something's going on, but nobody's doing something about it, the immediate gut reaction is to be like, okay, then I got to go do something about it, start an organization, join an organization, whatever it might be, and and save the world, right? And that's kind of the, the piece is Christianity conscientizes you to all kinds of weird ideas, some good and some bad. And then you feel like you need to kind of make something of those ideas or materialize them or, or secularize them or however you want to 
verbalize it. And uh, I think uh, one great contribution of your book is to sort of um, not say that we should not do anything or do nothing or something, but maybe create a more um, sophisticated way of like evaluating before we jump into something, we should probably think about all the harm we've done trying to do something about it. Um, you talk to you about lots of figures who are kind of apocalyptic figures or motivated by a sense of, of apocalypse. Um, tell us maybe a little bit about that kind of salvation addiction in Christianity. You know, what's going on there? Like, uh, I, I just imagine lots of listeners who are probably thinking, okay, we all know it's bad. Let's go do something about it. What should we be thinking about before we jump in and do something about it? Yeah, I mean, I think there are two things I think are kind of worth thinking about. And I think one is that... Um, there's a there's a relationship between Christianity and the the white savior industrial complex, right? This idea that um, as to be a Christian is to have access to kind of the solutions to all of the world's problems, to know to know what the solution is. The solution is Jesus. However, we kind of understand what that means. Um, and so, being a Christian is kind of inherently about having having the answers to the world's problems. And I think that leads to a tendency um, on the part of Christians, but on the part of uh, westerners particularly white westerners more generally to kind of think that we we know how to solve things and to kind of jump into situations um i talk in the book about a few different examples where um westerners have kind of intervened in global situations in ways that have actually made things worse rather than be better um so trying to uh intervene in the 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 2012 Olympics that was in Russia um, and uh, attempts to kind of campaign against Russia's homophobia in ways that actually really fed into um, some of the kind of complicated dynamics of homophobia in Russia. Uh, the the Kony 2012, uh, where people tried to kind of stop this African warlord without really understanding what the situation is. Um, and then Christian interventions in sex work, which I think is a, a, a kind of recurring theme in well-intentioned Christians trying to make things better and actually making things worse. So we often kind of start from uh, the assumption that we know how to fix things um, don't actually pay attention to the situations that we're intervening in are often really unwilling to grapple with the kind of moral complexity um, of those situations um, and I think the other thing is uh, something that I think about in terms of theodicy right we we recognize that there is suffering in the world and one of the ways that we try to feel okay about that is to tell ourselves that you know in the end everything's going to work out and um, all of this stuff is going to kind of work together for good in the end uh, whether you see that in a you know god's going to swoop down and save us or we're going to work out salvation through history kind of way um, and i think what happens when we're really committed to some kind of theodicy to making suffering meaningful um, is that we can end up justifying suffering in the name of some kind of good thing uh, that's coming um you know we uh, it's okay to to burn yourself out trying to campaign about this thing because ultimately it's going to produce this this thing that you're working towards that's worth it um it's okay to sacrifice this group of people or this issue um, or this kind of particularly marginalized cause because this thing that we're working for is is better um, and so I think one question for me is what would it look like to try and engage with the world without doing that kind of uh, theodical move and actually just trying to really face up to suffering and not necessarily see it as something that is going to be redeemed that is going to be kind of justified and actually to kind of to start from there um I think a lot about um Walter Benjamin's theses on the philosophy of history and and he says what would it look like to to look at history from the perspective of its victims, from the people who are left behind, who die, who suffer, um, whose whose lives are never redeemed. Um, and actually, maybe that's a better place to start than with this kind of idea that, that we're going in a direction that will justify things and actually will let us justify doing pretty kind of morally egregious things in the name of some good that's, that's worth sacrificing other people for. Yeah, that's really helpful to hear you talk about. I feel like a big theme in some of your work is is that distinction that you're laying out right there, that Christianity wants to do something good in the world. And oftentimes when it goes to do those things, it ends up, you know, doing the same bad thing over and over again and, and failing, right? Failure is a big a big theme here in, in your work, um, the theology of failure, um, aptly named. But uh, I guess one of the really helpful and maybe illuminating ideas I think I've gotten from your book, from this book and from some of the others that you've worked on is that like, you know, sometimes Christians will do good things in the world, <laughs> really interesting, good revolutionary things because of their Christianity. And then sometimes they don't. <laughs> and well, I mean, like a lot of times they don't. <laughs> Let's be real, I guess. Um, and I guess there's this like rhetorical strategy that a lot of Christians will kind of employ in those situations. I think that reflects this distinction that you're making here, 
where, you know, uh, Christians who do good things in history, they're true Christians. They're the really good ones, right? And and the Christians who do bad things that reinforce violence, that, uh, you know, support slavery or genocide or whatever, they aren't really true Christians. And uh, instead, uh, they're something else. They're, uh, I don't know, they're, they're bad Christians. They're unfaithful. They're fake, all this kind of stuff. Um, but I, I, something interesting in your work is that you kind of take a different approach saying that Christianity is is both of these things together. It's the good and the bad. I think that's a, a, a theme in your last book and in this one. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more of that dynamic out for us and, and how it plays into your current work about the end of the world. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing, one thing that seems to me really important is what happens to Christianity and the position of Christianity within society, sort of in the wake of the Reformation. Um, and I'm hand drawing here on Marxist feminism, this idea that that one of the things that defines the early capitalism is this division of the world into uh, productive and reproductive. So the kind of the world of work that's kind of masculinized, people go out and they make stuff to sell in the market. Um, and then the, the private sphere of reproduction, uh, which is associated with women, with housework, um, of kind of care, um, uh, raising children, cooking, cleaning, all those kinds of things. Um, and I think that one of the things that starts to happen in the Reformation, um, as we start to get the emergence of what's described as secular society is uh, an increasing association of Christianity with the reproductive sphere. So Christianity is, becomes associated with the home and the family, it becomes associated with women. Um, and I think that uh, the kind of spiritual work of prayer, um, of uh, running church services, those sorts of things, um, but come to be seen as kind of reproductive labour. And I think what that means for a lot of 20th century Western Christianity particularly is that um, Christianity tends to align itself with, with social reproduction. So the work of keeping people alive, um, of uh, caring for people who are sick, um, educating people, uh, forming people as moral subjects. Um, and I think because of uh, the way that uh, we tend to relate to these kind of productive and reproductive spheres. It often feels like the concern for reproduction is in conflict with uh, the concern for production. So when we're trying to defend uh, the reproductive sphere, we're pushing back against uh, the exploitation that happens in the productive sphere. So if you care that people aren't being paid enough um, to buy food and you start running food banks, uh, it feels like you're doing something that pushes back against uh, kind of, uh, yeah, exploitation. Um, but I think actually, uh, part of the, the Marxist feminist analysis is that actually the productive and reproductive spheres are reliant on each other. That in order for the productive sphere to keep going, people need to be kept alive. People need to have children. Those children need to be educated. They need to be formed as moral subjects. They need to be formed as uh, good workers, hard workers. Um, and so actually what feels like it's often radical um, in Christianity, particularly the kind of social justice kinds of concerns about feeding people, caring for the sick, um, teaching people to be good people and um, helping people deal with addiction and um, all of those kinds of things actually feels more radical than it is. And often what it's doing is, is keeping things going. Um, and it's not that it's totally bad. Um, it's good to care for people. It's good to keep people alive. It's good to be, feed people who are hungry. But if that's all that's happening, actually, what's going on is is just a kind of uh, contribution to sustaining the system as a whole. It doesn't actually threaten the system as a whole. It's part of keeping the system going. And I think for me, um, so so it's partly that it, it it kind of keeps other things going. But I think it's also that to keep people alive for capitalism, you have to um, keep them alive in ways that work for capitalism. So um, as you uh, teach people uh, ideas and concepts, I think about this a lot in, in terms of my work at a university, you're also teaching people things about what it is to be a good capitalist subject. Um, as people come to university, they take on debt and we are teaching them how to behave, how to stick to deadlines, how to meet the expectations of other people. And so however much, you know, I might want to think that I'm giving my students all these cool and radical ideas, I'm also forming them into the kinds of workers that capitalism wants. And so the, the ways that I try to care for my students are also really uh, indistinguishable from the, the forms of violence that are part of the work I do at a university. And I think it's that entanglement of care and violence that I think uh, a lot of Christians are not great at thinking about because we want to think about the care that we're doing. We want to care for people and we don't want to confront the ways that that care is, is also violence a lot of the time. So it's sort of trying to think about those two things as something that's been become, I think, increasingly important to me. 
I think it's really important to uh, emphasize that, that there are these kind of two things that always come together in, in Christianity. I don't know what it is about Christianity or Western logic or what that kind of encourages us to maybe see these things as zero-sum things, like everything has to be totally good or totally bad, but that just simple point maybe about uh, the ambiguity of Christianity and, and good works and so on is actually a really profound point. And I feel like it's probably easy for some folks to grab uh, examples from conservative Christianity. And, you know, you do a good job pointing out some of those examples too, right? Um, and thinking back to even some of your, your past work and talking about things like uh, like Donald Trump or kind of Christians uh, supporting white supremacy in this really explicit way and so on. But there's also a, a criticism there, I think, for kind of liberal or progressive Christianity, uh, which is sort of what, what you're getting at even in this reply, right? We kind of imagine that we're doing the progressive thing, kind of creating the safety nets for society, but in, in so doing, we're, we're also kind of enabling that violence to, to continue uh, by catching all the people who are getting, you know, spat out or something like that. Um, what's maybe the, the, the word there for kind of a, a progressive or, or liberal Christianity? I feel like it's maybe just harder for liberal Christians to sometimes see themselves in that critique or, or even to metabolize it in a way that's like, not completely debilitating, but maybe debilitating in the right way, or, you know, what I don't know what the right sort of uh, adjective is, but yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think I would suggest that it's uh, an issue for liberal and progressive Christians, but actually for the kind of secular left as well, there's been, I think, a real turn to thinking about care that again comes from this kind of Marxist feminist legacy of, of seeing the value of care, um, but uh, care is valuable for capitalism and because it's valuable for capitalism that means it can't be it can't be inherently liberating it can't be inherently good and i think that um out of a recognition that um you know a lot of the time uh the left is very focused on kind of uh sort of quite masculine ideas of conflict and struggle and recognizing that care is important i think we're maybe not always as good at recognizing the ways that care is also a problem um i keep joking that that one of my kind of side projects is a, a women are bad to project and actually recognizing the ways that um, a lot of the stuff that gets associated with women that gets associated with mothers um that gets associated with people in the caring professions so nurses teachers and um, those sorts of things and um, that, that they there is care there, but there's also violence. And actually, um, because always to keep people alive for a world that is built on violence is to reproduce that violence in your care for them, that you have to teach people and in some ways you have to teach people right like if i if i were to teach my students uh just like marxist theory but not give them any skills that would be useful for them in the workplace that wouldn't be great they would they would graduate into a world radically unequipped to survive in it and i don't want them not to survive but also in teaching this, them the skills that they need to survive i'm kind of forming them as capitalism wants them to be formed i'm teaching them certain things about how to behave about uh, encouraging them to accept certain things as kind of uh, an inevitable part of the way that things are um and so for me, the question is, yeah, like, how do you how do you care for people in ways that also kind of fuck them up a little bit uh, so that they can't just kind of neatly slot into uh, back into into the world as it is? Um, and I think it's really difficult, you know, like not not being equipped to survive in the world is a really painful and difficult experience. But it also, I think, is kind of necessary if we're going to start pushing back and start thinking about how to change things. And so how to kind of balance that need for, uh, yeah, the, the things that we need to do in order to survive, whilst recognising that our survival is caught up with the survival of capitalism, and how to kind of try and start disentangling those or start thinking about those differently, um, I think is really complicated, but really vital. Yeah, I, I think another place where this comes out in your current book is in your section called The Holy Family. Um, I really like this chapter a lot. And I'll talk about why maybe in a minute, but basically it's like a, it's, it's a, an essay about the lives of five women in the Bible, Mary, Bathsheba, Ruth, Rahab, Tamar, all, all of our faves, um, who are actually really complicated and have a pretty messy life in, I don't know, uh, in more than one way. Sometimes, um, they're all women who are like, you know, shoved into difficult situations because of like the bigger systems that they find themselves within kind of like we've been talking about, um, about the, uh, the contradictions in both the care and like uh, maintenance of capital that we kind of get ourselves into. Uh, but you have an interesting quote at the end of that that I think is maybe helpful um, that I guess I kind of want to read. You write, what would it mean to recognize that our inheritance as Christians is not so much that which makes us good, but that which implicates us in the messy realities of the world built on the double violence of patriarchy and property. I think there's something cool here um, because you're taking these like pretty, um, I don't know, well-known biblical characters, uh, biblical women, 
and you're kind of giving them this twist that is, um, I don't know, that, that complicates uh, the overbearing Christian morality <laughs> that I think a lot of Christians would like to wield against other people. So anyways, all I'm trying to say here is that you're, you're bringing together all these aspects that, you're, that you've been talking about, but you're also using, um, you know, these biblical characters to, to bring them out. So can you talk a little bit about your use of scripture in, in, in all of this too, and how the Bible plays into to some of your thought? Yeah. I mean, I really like the stories of those women because it really gets at, um, I think one of the, the kind of core cool ways that Christianity tells this story about it itself and about this kind of inner essence is through this idea of, of genealogy and that the, the, the way we talk about Christian identity is really bound up with ideas of kind of sexual and racial purity, actually, you know, this idea of a tradition handed down from the fathers. Um, and and all of those women, um, each of them kind of transgresses in various different ways, kind of norms of sexual propriety, um, uh, so Tamar uh, dresses up as a sex worker to seduce her father-in-law and get pregnant by him. Um, Rahab is a sex worker. Um, Ruth uh, migrates uh, with Naomi and kind of risks her reputation to go and lie down on the floor of the threshing room with Boaz. Um, uh, and they all, in certain ways, the stories kind of redeem all of them. It's like, you know, they they did this thing that doesn't really fit with what women are supposed to do, um, but um, they are righteous in the eyes of the Lord. Um, and I think one of the things I think that story really kind of uh, exemplifies is the way that actually this, this idea of Christianity as a pure tradition handed down has always been made possible by people um, behaving behaving badly or um behaving improperly um that you know we tell this story about this tradition and actually if you look at how christian theology emerges over the ages it's always involved in these kind of um indecent liaisons with other traditions with other people there are all these ideas coming in from elsewhere it's never been a pure thing um the, the idea of a kind of single single family single identity has always been kind of myth making um, and actually a lot of the time uh the the kind of norms and uh, uh moral ideas ideals that shape Christianity have put people in danger and people have had to take risks in order to survive Christianity. But that also what happens a lot of the time is um, that the, the thing, the risks that people take, um, the lines that people cross in order to keep things going, end up working not to undermine these ideals of purity, but actually to perpetuate them. So what's really interesting in the stories of most of the women is they take these risks, they do these things you're not supposed to do, they do these things that you know you could you could be killed for. So Tamar uh, is nearly burned when it's found out that she's pregnant by someone who isn't her husband, until it turns out that she's been smart enough to hold on to um, identifying items from Jacob so she can prove that he's a father um but at the end of the day she has a child um who is jacob's son who then makes it possible to kind of carry on this line of inheritance um even rahab um so what's really interesting about rahab is that um because she's a sex worker she has her own independent income she's the only person i think in the whole bible where um she's a woman and she has a family that's defined by its relationship to her the story says that her family continues in israel to this day um in the story her household are, are kind of dependent on her so she has this kind of independence precisely because she's outside of uh, sexual propriety she isn't married um, and yes at the same time what she does is she saves her family but she saves her family from uh, the kind of mass slaughter of everyone else in the city and so there are these post-colonial readings of Rahab that are like well you know <laughs> Um, she's she's selling out her city to this kind of invading genocidal army. It's not exactly a story of liberation. So you have these kind of women who have different degrees of freedom and independence, partly dependent on how willing they are to do the things you're not supposed to do. But actually what ends up happening in, in pretty much all of the cases is they do still keep things going and they don't kind of overturn, you know, you don't get Rahab and then everyone's like, hey, maybe we should um, be nicer to sex workers and recognise that, you know, for many women, it might be the best option available to them. Um, you continue with this stigmatisation that, that puts people at risk in the first place. And so, again, this kind of uh, recognising the things that people do for survival um, and actually trying to say, yeah, people do things for survival. Maybe we should rethink how we understand what purity is. Um, but recognising that actually a lot of the time, the things that people do for survival and not in themselves revolutionary or transformative, um, or they might be a bit revolutionary and a bit transformative, but still leave in place um, a lot of the systems and structures that put them at, at, at risk in the first place. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, again, that's kind of the interesting logic that you're kind of parsing out throughout the book, right? All these different ways that Christianity is like pushing a boundary and maintaining a boundary or creating a new boundary or whatever. And I mean, I feel like we could do a whole episode on every essay in the book because there are so many angles on it, whether it's gender and sex and gender or the economy or race and slavery and so on. Um, I feel like, though, we do have to talk about capitalism because it's the Magnificast, and you have a great chapter on capitalism and, and debt, so I thought it'd be a good one to dive into. Um, I mean, you, you talk about how Christianity has this ambivalent relationship to the market, like sometimes it limits the market, but other times it does the opposite, and it's also the Christianity is the grammar by which Christian or capitalism sort of took over the world, right? So it has this inextricable kind of relationship to it. Uh, but you take really seriously that idea that uh, you can't serve God and, and mammon at the same time. And what are we supposed to kind of do with that? Um, uh, you know, a troubling maxim, I guess, for a whole world built on serving God and mammon at the same time. So how can you, or, or how can you tell us maybe a bit about, about how Christianity and capitalism are, are bound up together? And how can Christianity also maybe lend us some other ways of maybe uh, subverting or sabotaging itself or, or capitalism uh, in, in the process? Yeah, I mean, so one of the things I talk about is is the way that there's been a lot of really interesting work in the last few years, sort of looking at the origins of money and the ways that money comes into being. You know, it, it has its origins in religion and that the idea of God and the idea of money are really kind of uh, uh, surprisingly similar. Um, uh, that, um, you know, Alfred Tone Rethel uh, has this book where he basically argues that um, it's the use of money that makes possible the kind of idea of the, the the kind of Greek one, which is in the background of a lot of Christian thinking about God. And um, that the the way that we use money um, produces this idea of this kind of absolute universal value um, of this 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 kind of one uh, kind of value that we can measure everything else by. Um, that uh, is kind of uh, simple and undivided. Um, and so the, the idea of God and the idea of money, I think, kind of emerge alongside each other um, and are really not as kind of separable as we might want to think they are. Um, and so that's, that's I, I guess, one aspect. And I think the other aspect is, again, if we're thinking about this transition to modernity, that one of the things that happens is Christianity becomes associated with the sphere of reproduction um, and the sphere of morality and that one of the things that's really central to the functioning of capitalism is morality actually that um in order to uh you know this is this is kind of Nietzsche's argument in order to be people who can take on debt and um, we need to be people who um, can be trusted to pay back debt so this idea of uh, being a certain kind of moral person who works hard who will pay back debts um who is going to be a good employee, all of these kinds of things, but actually a lot of what Christianity kind of does sustains that. And again, I think you see that um, pretty clearly in um, a lot of kind of contemporary Christian theology. So uh, the, one of the examples I talk about in the book is um, Justin Welby, who's the current um, Archbishop of Canterbury, um, who launched this campaign against Wonga, who are this payday loaning co loan company. Um, and what he says is uh, he does this campaign. He's like this this exploitative uh, uh, money lending is terrible, um, but it's not a critique of debt in general. It's not a critique of money lending in general. It's a critique of money lending that's too exploitative. So you can you can exploit people a little bit, but not too much. Um, and the church is going to step in and just just try and rebalance things. So we're, we're just exploiting people a kind of sustainable amount. And um, I think you see something similar in Catholic social teaching, um, uh, which often, rather than being like, let's destroy capitalism, says, um, what if we made capitalism work for human beings rather than the other way around? Um, and so I think often what you find in, in contemporary Christian engagements, even when we're talking about kind of more liberal and progressive ones, is often this sense of wanting to hold on to morality. But again, if if we need to be certain kinds of moral people to be good workers, to be good debtors, um, uh, we also, I think, need to believe in the kind of overall morality of the system. Um, and I think Christianity often helps us to sustain that. Um, to uh, make us feel like, you know, uh, things are in God's God's hands. Ultimately, everything's going to work out for the best. And um, rather than being like, hey, everything is everything is bad. We need to just destroy this whole system. So I think that that a lot of my sense is that a lot of kind of Christian engagements with capitalism start to fall into this um, uh, uh, exploitation, just not too much. Let's just kind of let's just make it a little bit more sustainable. Let's make it a little bit more manageable. Um, and again, that that can be really important for individual people's lives to to have a life that is sustainable rather than a life that is unlivable and um, is is not 
is meaningful for people. But ultimately, if if the the structure of capitalism is such that uh, exploitation is going to continue to intensify. Uh, it's going to keep needing to find new ways to kind of squeeze money out of people in ways that I think we're seeing all over at the minute, right? It just feels like uh, uh, a stage of capitalism where everything is becoming more and more exploitative and there's less and less kind of good stuff to be gotten in the middle of it. Um, and, and ultimately, I think if we if we want to say that this whole system has to go, um, Christianity can actually kind of uh, stop us getting to the, to the point of realising that and stop us getting to the point of being like, no, Debt is a moral full stop. Um, capitalism is a moral full stop. Um, and what would it look like to actually start to do theology in a way that says, yeah, you really can't worship God and mammon. Um, not like, oh, let's let's worship mammon a little bit to raise some money so we can do this thing that we care about as the church. Um, yeah, what would it what would it look like to treat uh, you know this idea that you can't worship God and mammon um, as an aspiration because it certainly isn't a reality at the moment. Yeah, that section is so good, um, especially the stuff about debt um is i think really fantastic there's a <laughs> i remember reading it and just kind of feeling like hit over the head with like oh man isn't this dumb why are we doing this that is, is bad we shouldn't allow for any of it um it's good uh a really sober view i think of uh of the ways that we mislead ourselves uh about uh capitalism and debt um m maybe a bit more on that actually uh a, a bit later on the book you have a chapter called god is useless that i think is really fun um for a lot of different reasons, mainly because of the title. Um, but, you know, there are all of these different uh, Christian schemes about work and debt and gender and sexuality, all these kinds of things out there, right? And they influence the way that we think of our, I, I don't know, other overarching um, systems of power, economy, everything else, right? Um, but you have this this turn or this argument uh, that theologically that, you know, that, that God isn't about any of these schemes or that creation isn't about any of these schemes. Instead, creation is about joy. And I wonder if you could talk about that part of your book a bit. Yeah. I mean, I think we get really locked into this kind of salvation history narrative that's been really important for Christianity, right? So God makes the world sin happens, the world needs rescuing, so God sends Jesus and then uh, redemption will happen. And you have a very clear kind of unfolding of purpose and meaning. Um, but actually, you know, if we, the kind of uh, core of the, the the kind of classical Christian theology says that um, that, that sin wasn't necessarily going to happen, um, that uh, God didn't create the world um, with this kind of inevitability of sin, there has to be there has to be something kind of contingent about sin. And what that means then is that there must have been a a reason for creating the world uh, before uh, the need for redemption came into being. So, and ultimately, that God didn't create the world um, because God needed something. Um, the, God wasn't like bored or lonely. Um, there's some brilliant. Um, I think it's uh, uh, Martin Luther who says, "What was God doing before God created the world? Uh, sitting in the forest, cutting sticks to beat people who ask." impertinent questions there's this sort of slight embarrassment around like this question of like well what was the point of things before we had this problem of sin that needs fixing um and i think that really the kind of classical answer to the question is um god created the world for no reason god didn't need to create the world and um, it wasn't necessary that god created the world and ultimately that means there's something kind of excessive um unnecessary um purposeless actually about god's creation um, and the one way of thinking about that is just for joy for 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 a laugh, um, for kicks, um, why not? Um, and yeah, that, that that maybe kind of behind um, this kind of uh, reality that we experience of things being broken and needing fixing, there's a kind of deeper reality of um, there's there's really no reason for things to exist. Things could just as easily not exist, um, and uh, it's cool that they exist. Uh, that didn't need to be the case. Um, and so maybe rather than just getting so stuck in uh, this focus on things needing redeeming, um, and I think just uh, uh, again, if we're thinking about practicality, I think it can be really easy to get so overwhelmed by how many things are uh, broken around us, by how much suffering there is. Um, and I think that if you get you know, there's there's so much of the world and we as individuals are relatively small parts of that. It can be really overwhelming and it can kind of uh, grind us down. But I think there's this, this kind of deeper question of like, what what are things for? Um, and I think for me, that connects up with with some kind of psychoanalytic stuff about desire that, uh, you know, if we think about where where our deepest desires come from, uh, it's ultimately something it's not something we choose. There's not we don't kind of sit down and rationally be like, I'm going to be a person who deep he wants to do this with my life desire is just something that kind of happens to us that's kind of inexplicable but that actually can kind of uh 
lead us to experiences of uh, great joy uh, and pleasure and delight, uh, not because of any kind of meaning or purpose, but just because. Um, so what would it look like for us to think about the world as a, a, a place to, to ask this question of what we really want, uh, to think about the world not as kind of fundamentally existing for a reason, but just for itself? Um, uh, because it's cool and interesting and weird um, and to, to kind of have some space to engage with with joy uh, and uh, yeah uh, nonsense maybe as well um, yeah yeah I really like that chapter as well and I think because something you said earlier in the uh, at the show um, really has been resonating with me you know we can think that it's such a good thing to change the world or we're fighting for a cause that's righteous or good or just or whatever and in so doing we burn ourselves out or kind of harm ourselves in order to make that happen and I spend every day of my life trying to avoid that situation uh, professionally so that's uh, really sitting with me or I'm sitting with that right now and I think the God is useless chapter is such a good challenge too to kind of say, well, you know, if you really want to change the world or, or do something different or uh, make a different kind of world, then, you know, there's also maybe maybe some resource in the Christian tradition that that allows you to to chill out in such a way that you could actually be like a functional human being and and even, you know, not necessarily effective, I guess, but somehow like, you know, more more kind of um, at home with yourself such that you could be at home in some other kind of world or I don't, I don't really know I'm kind of struggling to find the language here but uh you know what what do you think about that like what does that enable us to do maybe yeah I mean it, it, it's really interesting because I find this as well but it's so difficult to get out of the logic of you know if I have fun then I'll be able to do this work better or be more functional and this idea of rest is something that kind of performs a function um one of the the things I talk about in the book is is Frank Wilderson, who has a critique of um, Gramsci's idea of hegemony, and basically his he, his kind of analogy is uh, that um, if you imagine uh, the world as a uh, um, slaughterhouse, basically, um, you have uh, cows who are going in to be slaughtered, you have workers who are working in to be slaughtered. A lot of Marxism is focused on the the problem of the workers who want to maybe stop production so they can go back for better pay and conditions. Um, his argument is that the way that black people are positioned in the world is more like the cows, uh, the purpose of uh, the, the, the the function that blackness plays in the world is just to, to kind of be slaughtered and die. Um, and so what we find in uh, the position occupied by black people is a more uh, revolutionary possibility than we find in the position of the white worker, because that revolutionary possibility is an absolute refusal of work and um, the desire not for the factory to kind of go at a more manageable pace or let people get rested so they can come back to work refreshed the next day, but actually just to stop it. Um, and that kind of that idea of rest as a kind of revolutionary potential, not not rest for the purpose of work, but rest as an end in itself, as a as a good in itself. Um, maybe is a is a is a kind of way to think about destroying the system as a whole. Um, or yeah, I mean, even that starts to turn rest into something functional, right? But but there's there's this possibility of yeah, of, of seeing of seeing rest, of seeing pleasure, and um, not as as things that will help us to do other stuff better, but actually as things that are good in themselves. And that actually if we can uh I, I really feel like yeah, both both Marxism and Christianity really fall into this kind of logic of of work or productivity and effectiveness, right? And what would it mean to actually start to try and unpick that in ourselves? Yeah, a big challenge for me, a Christian who reads a lot of Marx and uh, can't stop working, a huge workaholic here I am doing a podcast on my lunch hour. So <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to think more about that here in 2024. Um, well, Marika, you, you introduced one chapter by saying that you're a millennial. Uh, and I'm it's just striking me that even what you're saying just now feeds into that in some interesting ways. Uh, you, you say that being a millennial is sort of being part of a generation that was supposed to believe things that were kind of trending in a good direction. And then the rug is kind of pulled out from under us, you know, socially, economically, politically in our adulthood. And, you know, a lot of our listeners are millennials. Uh, Matt and I are both millennials as well. Um, what does it mean to be writing kind of millennial theology? I mean, is the God is useless chapter? Is this the avocado toast chapter? And the rest of it is kind <laughs> of like, like the, the, you know, millennial resentment chapters or, you know, what does that really mean, though, to be kind of thinking theologically as part of that, like, I think generational cohort language is very weird and, and not always very productive either. But there is something to that that I think is really fascinating. And yeah, you know, you're kind of witnessing the end of the world, but not really wanting the end of the world in some other way as a millennial. Uh, how does that kind of feature in the, the theologizing you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of what I've been thinking about, I guess, is like what it what it means to be in a world where 
you know, I think I, I grew up in the kind of very uh, in the middle of like the, the neoliberal 90s where we were encouraged to think about our own capacities for endless self-transformation and achievement. And then I think a lot of uh, a lot of people I know have kind of experienced this thing where we we maybe felt that a little bit at school. And then as we started graduating, suddenly kind of emerged into this world where actually possibilities were shutting down um, and um, all of these these possibilities and opportunities that we were promised just increasingly aren't there. So, um, you know, academia as an industry is in a crisis. Uh, lots of other industries are in crisis. Um, and I think I think because of the different kinds of crises that we're facing everywhere, because a lot of us also have kind of uh, been around uh, in societies where we've had years and years of austerity um it, it feels to me like a lot of the ways that i feel like i should be able to shape what happens around me are just not there um that uh it's hard to it's hard to uh organize a lot of the time because everyone is exhausted and struggling just to survive um uh it's uh um it's difficult to engage with our institutions because our institutions are so locked into doing particular ways of things that it feels like however smart you try to be with your interventions and um, however measured you try to be with the things that you say, it just feels like you're constantly kind of running into brick walls. Um, and I think I think for me, that's partly this why this question of. Um, yeah, of, of kind of joy is important. Like, what does it mean to let go of this sense that was really instilled in me of me as someone who has the capacity to shape things around me? And actually, there's a there's a point where you start to run into blocks. Um, and however much you try and think uh, with other people, uh, not just trying to do things by yourself. And um, it just feels like so many things are, are really kind of immovable at the minute and it's difficult. And so it's partly trying to think about like how to not let that destroy you. Um, and to to not let this kind of feeling of things shutting down destroy you um and i wonder a little bit as well um uh i'm also kind of hitting the midlife crisis age just about um uh you know that and, and that a lot of i think that stage of life is starting to realize that um you have made some choices that have set certain things in your life um certain possibilities are not available to you because of choices that you've already made and so sort of trying to make peace with with certain kind of limits and i think a lot of one of the kind of big themes of the book, I guess, is kind of how to try and think about the relationship between wanting to feel like uh, I have space to express things or do things or um, move things around. And yet also the sense of certain things being kind of set in place. Um, and yeah, which I mean, so the, the last chapter of the book talks about freedom um, and, and something I've been thinking about a lot is how much our idea of freedom is uh, emerges out of the reality of slavery that that what it means to be free in the west is to, is is understood in contrast with slavery um uh, so some people are enslaved they're not free by contrast with those enslaved people i am free um and i think um, again there's been a lot of really kind of interesting recent work sort of thinking about the relationship between christianity and slavery um and and starting to think about what would it mean to see myself not as someone who um has limited agency but as someone who uh is in lots of ways the product of the world that has made me and um, that that my options uh, my possibilities are kind of constrained by stuff that i don't control um, and to to both to recognize that and also to try and find some pleasure in that not to see not to see limits on my freedom and my capacity as necessarily a problem but actually is kind of constitutive of of what it is to be a person um uh, uh Zizek talks about um uh the kind of ethical goal of sort of uh, taking responsibility for your fate, um, which I like to think of um, in terms of the, the Dolly Parton maxim, uh, find out who you are and do it on purpose. Right. We we however much we've been encouraged to see ourselves in this way, we don't decide what kind of people we are. We don't decide what we want. Um, a, a lot of stuff that we are is just stuff that has happened to us. And then we kind of have to try and figure out how to relate to that. Um, so what does it mean to kind of take pleasure in that, not just to see it as a kind of a, a limit or frustration? And um, what does it mean to, to to recognize and acknowledge that um uh, uh and part of that i think again is a, a kind of move away from thinking of ourselves as kind of self-sovereign individuals as masters of our own uh, uh selves um, and to recognize the ways that we're actually deeply dependent on other people we're deeply dependent on things around us that we don't fully control and how to kind of think about uh, relating to that in ways that are pleasurable as well as frustrating Cool. A good word when you can bring together Slava Zizek and Dolly Parton. It's always a, a, a lovely moment. Um, well, uh, we've done the critique, the critique of everything that exists sort of moment. Uh, and now it's time to do the maintenance of capitalism part uh, with the most, with 
with the most important question, where can people find uh, more of your work and uh, ultimately buy your book? Um, so the publisher of the book is SCM Press. I think if you're in the UK, you can buy it directly from them. Um, I think in the US, the most direct place would be Westminster John Knox Press, um, but uh, also available in hopefully your, via your local bookshops or uh, uh, various um, online websites. Um, so this is my recent book, my first book, um, Theology for the End of the World, was published by Fordham University Press. Um, it engages with, with some similar themes in a more academic register. Um, there's a, an old Magnificast episode if people want to get a bit more of a feel for that one. Um, and that, I mean, the focus of that book is um, how do we think about Christianity as made up of uh, uh, all the bad things as well as the good things and not just try and kind of distill some good version of Christianity um, and chuck away all the stuff we don't like. A great one. And still uh, one of our top listened to episodes. So Marika has uh, been a big hit and I'm sure this one will be up there as well. Uh, we should say too, at the end, uh, you do some blogging too at the Itself blog, a kind of legendary blog in the religious humanities blogging world. So as, as much as it continues to exist or not, I don't know. But uh, nevertheless, uh, folks are still writing great stuff over there. And uh, one thing that Marika does often is post uh, syllabi and uh, requests for kind of interesting resources related to those syllabi and so on. And I feel like a lot of listeners would probably appreciate looking over some some things there too. Uh, yeah, I, at least I've enjoyed <laughs> having uh, access to, to some of your curated syllabi there So uh, and, and other pieces of writing as well. Thanks for coming on, Marika. And uh, where else can people find you also on, on social media or anything like that? Or uh, have those all become secret <laughs> means of communication? Uh, yeah. I am also on Twitter, uh, which I refuse to call by its rebranded name. Um, I'm on Blue Sky. Uh, I keep meaning to use it more. We'll see what happens. Um, yeah. So I think those would be the best places for people to find me. Thanks for listening to The Magnificast. If you like what you heard, you can support us at patreon.com slash The Magnificast. And if you do it at two bucks or more, you can join our Discord and start reading the Bible with the rest of us. Uh, also, pick up uh, Marika's book, Theology for the End of the World, by uh, published by SEM Press. It is fantastic. You're going to love it. It's a great piece of writing out there in the world. Uh, let's see. Our music is by Amaria Armstrong, and our outro is by The Illogical Spoon. And we'll see you next week. Get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord.